everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of Cars Tour Today. I'm your host, Tony Stevens. I'm so glad to have you back with us once again. We've got a jam-packed show this week as we look forward to our race on May 9th at Hickory Motor Speedway. So let's waste no time and go ahead and get started and take a look at the highlights from the Late Model Stock Tour at Orange County on April the 16th. For the second time this year, the Cars Racing Tour hit the track on Saturday, April 16th. The second stop of the season was the Orange County Speedway, and the big names came out in both divisions to race one of the region's fastest and most action-packed tracks. NASCAR Truck Series regular Timothy Peters captured the Hedgecock Pole Award in the late mile stock division, away from second year driver Stephen Parsons, who started the race alongside. Peters jumped out to the early lead, but it was short-lived. Deke McCaskill quickly tracked down his former rival and made his way around the number 12 of Peters on lap three of the race. Just like at Southern National, Tommy Lemons qualified outside the top 10 and had to work his way forward into contention. Two and three wide racing was the name of the game as the driver of the Jumpstart Motorsports number 27 quickly made up ground. As the race wore on, it was apparent that Lemons had a fast race car, but the competition had no willingness to cut him a break, racing him hard yet clean as he clawed his way up the running order. Meanwhile, fifth place starter R.D. Smith had business to tend to at the front of the field. Around the one-third mark of the race, the former Ace Speedway track champion began to make some noise, working his way around Josh Berry for the third spot. As Timothy Peters conserved his equipment, Smith made his way around the autos by Nelson Toyota and established himself in the runner-up position soon after bypassing Berry. Peters continued to fall towards the tail of the top five through the mid-stages of the race, allowing Josh Berry, Myatt Snyder, and Tommy Lemons all to get around him as he worked his own pace. Just past halfway, the race saw its first caution flag when second place starter Stephen Parsons had issues in turn three, bouncing off the concrete multiple times through the north end of the facility. Following the restart, R.D. Smith fired up the oven on leader Deke McCaskill. Lap after lap, Smith attempted to use the bottom of the racetrack to muscle around the Ford of McCaskill. The two made contact on more than one occasion eventually loosening up the right front fender of Smith, and the freshly freed body parts soon left their home and found their way onto the track, bringing out a yellow flag. On a restart with 39 laps to go, it was a free-for-all in the first turn. Pole sitter Peters quickly worked his way around Josh Berry for third and spent very little time disposing of challenger R.D. Smith as well. Like many races in years gone by, it was once again Peters and McCaskill left to duel for the top spot. The final restart of the night on lap 213 pitted Peters and McCaskill alongside each other for the race lead into turn one. But the battle didn't last very long. Peters was able to clear McCaskill within the same lap for the point. Despite a flurry of slower traffic towards the end of the race, Timothy Peters held on for his first career Cars Late Model Stock Tour win over Deke McCaskill, Josh Berry, Myatt Snyder, and Tommy Williams Jr. So congratulations to the Nelson Autosport crew and Timothy Peters. They certainly did their homework and came out to beat the best late mile stock drivers in the country. We look forward to having them at more Cars Tour races as their schedule permits. But don't go away. We'll be back with some super late model highlights. But before we do all of that, let's give you the full rundown from the late model stock portion of the Orange Blossom 300 presented by The Grilling Store. It started with a win and a dream of going faster, grinding, testing, pushing the limits, winning broad competition. Competition spawned innovation and a great sense of pride. 40 years later, we're still winning. <laughs> 2016, the year of Cobb Cams. The Edelbrock Big Carb Deal is back. 
Purchase any new Edelbrock Performer or Thunder Series carburetor and receive a free air cleaner and fender cover. Offer valid for March 1st, April 30th. Visit edelbrock.com today for full details. This thing could totally revolutionize what it's like to pull fuel from every single section in a fuel tank. This thing is crazy. It's unbelievable. It's so stupid, simple, and weird, but it's rad, so check it out. Welcome back to Cars Tour Today. You know, if you thought the late model stock race looked like fun, you wouldn't be alone. By itself, that race probably would have been worth the price of a ticket to Orange County. But with even more star power than the super late model event, well, those drivers had a little bit more to live up to. And they certainly were up to the task. Take a look. In the super late model portion of the Orange Blossom 300 presented by the Grilling Store, Trevor Knowles led the field to green for the second consecutive event, backing up his Molly Pole Award from Southern National two weeks prior. But unlike Southern National, Knowles was able to settle into the race lead after bringing the field to green. That advantage didn't last long, however, as Kyle Busch Motorsports driver Christopher Bell soon found a way around the Knowles cabinet entry on lap number 10 and began to pick up exactly where he left off in this race one year ago. Knowles fought back a few laps later, but was unable to do anything early with the number 51 Toyota. Meanwhile, former Snowball Derby champion and NASCAR Truck Series star John Hunter Nemechek was working his way towards the front after starting outside row six. Behind Nemechek, another youngster, Rafael Lessard, was also inching his way towards Bell in the David Gilliland Racing number 99 Toyota. In the early stages, the number 58 of Tyler Ankrum was also a force to be reckoned with, working his way around Knowles and riding in second for a large portion of the event after starting the night in the third position. Hometown favorite Tate Fogelman had issues early in his number eight Ford. After contact with another car, Fogelman nearly lost control off turn four a few laps later, but made one heck of a save to keep it rolling. He later retired, however, on lap 45. As the race closed in on the one-third mark, Rafael Lessard continued his charge forward, working around John Hunter Nemechek to crack the top five. Also advancing was Quinn Howe, the winner at Southern National. His team was forced to change motors on Friday after a rocker arm issue, and Howe then awoke on Saturday with flu-like symptoms, yet persevered to race. Under a lap 54 caution for debris, July Orange County winner Brandon Setzer came in for service on his Ford. After starting deep in the field, Setzer struggled to find speed early in the race and took advantage of the caution to make massive changes. On lap 57, the largest incident of the night occurred. After a chain reaction started between Quinn Half and Stephen Nassi in turn two, Nassi and Cole Tim made contact, sending the Florida driver into the outside wall and ultimately ending his night after a strong run. Soon after the restart, the later players began to serve notice of their speed. Dalton Sargent in the Windows 10 Camry worked his way to second behind Bell, while Canadian teenager Lassard bypassed Tyler Ankrum for third on lap 69. Three laps later, the first sign of trouble showed for two pre-race favorites. John Hunter Nemechek had issues in turn three, hanging on to his race car, while Preston Peltier and Quinn Half made contact, nearly sending Peltier into the inside wall on lap 72. Just past halfway, pole sitter Trevor Knowles continued to backslide through the running order. After seeing Zane Smith go by, Knowles tried to battle back, but John Hunter Nemechek had already started his attempt to maneuver around Knowles. The two washed up the banking and, apparently frustrated by the circumstances of the previous laps, Knowles sent Nemechek for a ride, bringing out the caution on lap 79. Lady Luck once again frowned upon pole sitter Knowles not long after the restart. The right side exhaust pipe began to dislodge itself from the race car, forcing race control to issue a black flag for the Fathead Racing Team to come pit side to repair the damage. Knowles then stopped on track to draw a yellow flag and minimize the time loss while in the pits, but he was docked a lap by cars to officials for the stunt while the crew repaired the issue under the yellow flag. Truck Series star John Hunter Nemechek added insult to his injuries on lap 109 when he went for another spin in turn four. The team later said John Hunter's tires were toast from his first spin on lap 80, and this incident evidenced that statement. On the final restart of the night, it was Bell once again getting the jump 
over Dalton Sargent and Rafael Lassard. The three Toyotas then began to pull away from the field to settle it in the closing laps. As the money lap drew closer, Lassard and Sargent battled side by side for laps on end with neither gaining an advantage. All the while, both drivers were closing in on leader Christopher Bell. With 14 circuits to go, Lassard finally cleared Sargent and focused his efforts on the Kyle Busch-owned number 51 immediately in front of him. Lassard tried multiple times to bypass Bell off of turn two, yet Bell slammed the door in the face of the youngster each and every attempt. Undeterred, he consistently fought back, making contact with Bell on more than one occasion as the pair duped it out for the race win. Ultimately, Lassard's advances were not enough. Christopher Bell hung on for his fourth career car super late model tour, powered by VP Fuel's win, with Lassard, Sargent, Brandon Setzer, and Preston Peltier rounding out the top five. Wow, my pulse is still racing, even after just watching the highlight clip. You know, there's only so much that that video can relay to you, the viewer. There was so much action, so much intensity, comers, goers, storylines, you name it. All I know is that our drivers are going to try it like heck to replicate that kind of intensity at Hickory on Saturday, May the 7th. It really makes you wonder just what kind of a show we're going to see. But after watching all of that, I need a refresher. So we'll take a break and leave you with the super late model finish from Orange County. race teams with over 95 years of performance technology leadership for the difference between a better piston and the best piston choose molly motorsports edelbrock is backing their e4 supercharger systems with an unprecedented warranty the three-year 36,000 mile limited warranty provides up to sixteen thousand five hundred dollars in parts and repair coverage with an e4 supercharger you know that you'll be covered One of the best things about the Cars Tour is simply the variety of talent. We have veterans at each race, the guys you think of when you think of late model racing, be it supers or late model stock cars. We've got the youngsters trying to make a name for themselves as rookies in this type of racing. And then we have everybody else kind of in between. One of those guys who might be considered in between is Austin McDaniel. As a former track champion at Hickory Motor Speedway, the next stop on the Cars Tour schedule, we took a little bit of time to sit down and talk about the upcoming race and more. So Austin McDaniel, it is your second year in the Carter's Tour. Tell me a little bit about how your first year went first off and some of the highlights that stood out. Uh, well, we finished seventh in points. Uh, <clears throat> not as good as we'd like to, but it wasn't too bad, you know, finishing the top 10 in uh, the first year. But uh, the highlight of the year was definitely the race at Hickory. Uh, this time last year, we actually finished second to the defending series champion, Brayton Halls. Uh, we put on a really good battle at the end of the race. I think the last 20 laps or so, we ran side by side. And uh, I, don't even, I don't think we touched once. So that was a, a really good race. And even though we finished second, that was still uh, a big deal for us. Why did you pick that time to travel? Was it simply the fact the car store came about and it looked like everything was in place for what you wanted to see? Or was it some other factor? It kind of seemed like the right time. We had won the two-track championships, and was like, well, you know, what else is there to do at Hickory? And so, about the same time the car store was coming out, and I'd always wanted to travel. And up until that point, we'd only raced at two or three other tracks. So, once that came up, and tracks like Concord, Motor Mile, and places like that, it was kind of a no-brainer to, you know, take the next step in the car store. So, since we're talking about your first year, how would you grade it? What were the things you really enjoyed? Obviously, that race at Hickory, I'm sure, was one of them, but... What were the things you enjoyed? What were some of the things you looked back on and said, we need to do this better or maybe improve upon certain things? The biggest thing was just, for a lot of us, it was 
the first time going to a track, you know, first time going to Motor Mile, first time going to Concord. So we struggled a little bit at places like Motor Mile and Tri-County, but uh, Concord Speedway is 15 minutes from my house and I've been there racing legend cars on the quarter mile track, but never on you know, the half mile track. So if I could look back at one of the most fun races, it was definitely Concord. Um, so maybe a B plus or B minus on the, the year itself. Um, not too bad, but you know, we've got something to definitely build upon this year. You talk about changes and things to build upon. Your cars are now here at Lee Falk Racing. Why here? Uh, we've known Lee and Michael and everybody for a long time. Now we've got to know them really good and uh, the cars are solid everywhere they go. And so I thought it would be a good time to team up with them and so far it's been really good. And, uh, we're looking forward to the rest of the year. What kind of knowledge base do these guys have to pull from that's helped you? Because they were your biggest competitor or one of them at Hickory when you raced there, were they not? Yeah, the biggest thing is Michael. He's got driving experience, so that's really helpful. But if, if you take a look at these cars, you can pretty much eat off of them. They, I think they're by far the nicest cars at the racetrack. So to be teamed up with them, that's definitely a big benefit. But just having my crew chief, Jonathan Morrison, and Michael and Lee to kind of pull off of, we've got a bunch of experience and a bunch of racing knowledge to kind of pull from and you know bounce ideas off each other. You see, Josh Berry is the guy you've got to beat. You've raced him there weekly. You've raced him there in the Cars Tour. And you've got a number of wins at Hickory yourself. What is it you think that Josh Berry has that you're chasing right now? I'm not sure. Whatever it is, that's kind of that's kind of what we're chasing. But we won the track championship in 2012 and 2013. He picked up right where we left off in 2014. So even though we've got maybe a little bit more of experience there, you know, he's got a couple years there. So... Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Whatever we're chasing, we're not sure. But uh, they've got it figured out, so I think he'll definitely be the one to be. Where do you think that advantage lies, at least for yourself, to maybe take yourself to that level where you think you need to be? I think it's a little bit of everything. I think I can you know, be a little bit better, and we hopefully we can go test in the next week or so to get the car where it is. I don't think we're far off. It's just you know, a little fine-tuning here and there can you know, go a long ways. So if we can get to the track and go practice and test, hopefully we can hit on something. Is there anything you do that's not engine related? You mentioned four wheelers and race cars and all this other. Do you do? Any, I mean, do you play poker? Do you play golf? Or, or is everything in your life focused around something with wheels? Uh, I like being out on the water too. Uh, I like being out on the lake and riding, you know, jet skis and wakeboarding and stuff like that. So, anything fast paced, uh, sitting still, is just never really sounded too interesting to me. I hadn't really got into golf or poker or anything like that, but. Uh, so yeah, a, a rel relaxing day for me away from the track would probably be out on the lake somewhere. How long do you plan on staying racing with the Cars Tour? And as everything else goes, it's, you know, kind of funding permitted. Um, but if not, then I'm perfectly content, you know, years down the road. Uh, you know, Dick McCaskill is really strong and he, he's been racing late models for a long time. So just play people like that and Philip Morris, all the, the, uh, the old timer guys, you know, that have, have been around for so long and still kicking all these kids butts, you know, so being one of those guys down the road, that's definitely uh, an aspiration too. You know, if I can't make it in the, the top three series, then uh, I'm having just as much fun racing late models. So if Austin McDaniel was the king of car store racing and short track racing, you'd be okay with that? Yeah, absolutely. That, that sounds pretty good to me. Uh, those guys are getting a lot of recognition for it, you know, so I'd be uh, perfectly happy with that. You know, something tells me Austin McDaniel is going to have just a little bit more motivation to find his way to victory lane after that runner-up finish from one year ago. By the way, if you'd like to see the entire interview with Austin McDaniel, it can be found on the Cars Tour YouTube and Roku channels. Up next, we'll talk with legendary short tracker Dennis Setzer about the upcoming race at Hickory and preview the Race to End Hunger 250. Stay with us. Get the same quality and performance the pros depend on when you fill up at VP Racing Fuels. And while you're there, check out VP Maditives, formulated by the mad scientist to give your ride a seat of the pants boost. Visit VPRacingFuels.com for more information. Watch Tudor Championship action on Fox. Check the TV schedule at IMSA.com. Cars Racing Tour invades Hickory Motor Speedway on Saturday, May 7th with speed, thrills, and excitement from the nation's premier late model series featuring the best teams and drivers. 
It's two action-packed races in the span of one night. This is Hickory's biggest springtime event, and adult tickets are only 20 bucks with youth discounts. Spectator gates open at 4, and racing begins at 7. Saturday, May 7th, 7 p.m. Get more info at carsracingtour.com. In case you didn't know by now, Hickory Motor Speedway is the site of the race to end Hunger 250, the next stop on the Cars Tour calendar. It's nicknamed the birthplace of the NASCAR stars, mainly because of its history of producing top tier talent over the decades. We chatted with one of those drivers, Dennis Setzer, to get an idea of just how difficult it is to negotiate Hickory Motor Speedway. Ah, it's a fun racetrack, you know, it's got a lot of character to it. I guess that's what we call tracks that have rough pavement and humps and bumps and cracks and everything else. We, we turned that into character now, it seems like that's the way to go, but it is fun, you know. Uh, you know, you cross the start-finish line there, you go off into one, there's a pretty good dip there. Flattens out a little bit on the bottom down in the middle of one and two. And then, uh, you know, there's a pretty usable apron there off the two right there. You can actually drop that left right down on that thing and turn it if you're tight. You can get up on the banking and uh, rim ride it off. You know, I've seen there's three or four distinct lines that hit you through one and two. So, a yeah, pretty good bump down the back straightaway as you come off of two right there where the pavement overlap, where it's been paved either in 92, 02, or 06, or 08, somewhere throughout range. There's some pavement overlaps there. Same thing going into three, some more pavement overlaps. And three and four is the same deal, you know. I think it's like 93 we paved that place and we went there with with the bush cars back then. As soon as we paved it, the radials ripped up the pavement and it's, it's kind of chatters the front tires sometimes through that area, down the low groove through there. And uh, you know, coming off four is a little bit, quite a bit different than, than two. Four is a pretty abrupt corner right there where two sweeps pretty good and uh, you know, just, just a lot of fun. You, you got a lot to work with. You got to do the balancing act between two and four, same way between one and three. Three sweeps in where one's a pretty abrupt corner. So uh, a lot of fun things to work with. Keeps the driver on his toes. You can uh, work really hard in one area. You think that'll pay dividends in later in the race. You know, the driver's got to choose that, and the crew chief sometimes can help him a little bit. Wow. All that explanation, and the track is just over a third of a mile long. I guess now we know why so many of those top-tier stars came through Hickory. So before we part ways today, let's take a little time to preview the upcoming Race to Win Hunger 250 presented by the Hickory Soup Kitchen. Last year, William Byron held off a hard-charging Chase Elliott en route to his very first career Cars Tour Super Late Model win. But both of those drivers have commitments in Kansas, as does Christopher Bell, who won at Hickory in October. So we're guaranteed a different Super Late Model winner. Steve Wallace will be back with the Tour at Hickory, one of his favorite racetracks, as will Harrison Burton, Tyler Church, and numerous others. So it's wide open on the Super Late Model side of things, and take a look at some of these drivers coming in, including Canadian Hot Shoe, Raphael Lassard. He'll be leading the points coming into Hickory by just one marker over Quinn Howth and two over defending series champion, Cole Tim. As for the late mile stocks, Josh Berry is the only former winner who will be in the field on May the 7th, taking home the trophy last October in the season finale. Defending event winner Brayton Hawes is still looking for sponsorship for his efforts, meaning there's an equally good chance of seeing a new winner in the late model stocks as there is the super late models. Deke McCaskill will tell you he's never been great at Hickory, but he's atop the standings coming into this third event of the season. Behind him, Barry, Tommy Lemons, and Myatt Snyder are all separated by just two points. What's that mean for you, the race fan? It means we can almost promise you one heck of a show Saturday night, May 7th, at Hickory Motor Speedway. In other news, the Cars Tour Roku channel has been submitted for approval to Roku. That approval process generally takes a couple of weeks. Stay tuned to the Cars Tour social media channels for more info on its release. Of course, our next race is Saturday, May the 7th at Hickory Motor Speedway. As always, tickets are just 20 bucks, but if you can't be there, make sure to tune it in live on our broadcast partner, Race Feed X. They'll cover every single lap of competition and you'll feel just like you were there. Until next time, I'm Tony Stevens, looking forward to seeing you at a Cars Tour race at a track near you sometime soon. But until then, so long, everybody.